we we do our thing here so everybody can at least get a part of it. Scott, I'm going to start off and throw a throw something a sidearm at you. OK, this is a, 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 OK. You know, we everybody's familiar with the Putin speech, with the issue of the START Treaty, with where, the you know, most people can figure out where that leads. Right. With what's going on with the neocons and their attempt to for for world hegemony, shall we say. OK. This is something I'm going to throw at you. The, the Chinese and the Russians are in Africa. They're doing a military exercise with the South African military. We could be doomed, but possibly there's a way out. If Russia and China says we are a military alliance, you attack one, you attack us both. It is possible then that the military and the neocons will say, we know we can't beat them both, so we can't go to war with them, that that's our only hope. So I'm just throwing that out there as a, as a, as a thought project to hear from you, Scott. Well, I mean, that's the West mirror, you know, projecting a mirror image of itself on the Russians and the Chinese. That's not how they operate. Um, they don't want an alliance. Mm -hmm. In fact, they both have bragged about how what they have is better than any alliance because there's literally no restrictions. See, an alliance has to be defined by a document, it spells out commitments, and obligations, etc. And even a you know wonderful alliance like NATO, you find out in the end it's not as wonderful as everybody thinks it is because, gosh, Article Five isn't quite the uh, old <laughs> dogma that. Um, that, that uh, Joe Biden thinks it is, uh, at least when he articulates it in Warsaw. Um, you know, uh, what the Chinese and the Russians have is uh, adaptable. Um, it can be adjusted based upon realities. Uh, uh, there, there's no pressure. Um, believe me, once you sign a treaty, uh, almost immediately there's regret. <laughs> you know? And uh, there's no regret with the Russians and the Chinese right now because there's no pressure. There's no artificial expectations. It just is what it is. Um, right now, it's a relationship that's defined primarily on the friendship between uh, the two leaders. Um, and it's a real friendship. It's a sincere friendship. Um, and it, it's it's one that actually gives them great latitude to operate independent of the other. You notice that China isn't running in um, saying we support Russia 110% on Ukraine. Um, but China doesn't have to. China's doing that which is necessary to um, help Russia stay afloat in the face of sanctions. Um, because of their friendship, they have commonality that is uh, that that's defined by the moment. Uh, and right now, China understands that that which is happening to Russia will happen to China. And if left unfettered in Europe, uh, the collective West would be able to accumulate resources and uh, power in the Pacific and confront China over the Taiwan issue. That China's uh, best hope right now is for a Russian victory, that it's in China's interest to have a Russian victory. But China has to be careful, and Russia recognizes the need for China to be careful because China do doesn't want to provoke, unduly provoke the United States into a premature conflict or into a worsening of economic relations at a time when um, you know China needs uh, to continue the expansion of its economy. And understand this, Russia needs China's economy to continue to expand. So it's not in Russia's interest, who is desperately looking for uh, a, 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 an expanded Chinese economic uh, you know, purchasing of, of, of Russian energy. If China gets into a trade war with the United States and there's a constriction of the Chinese economy, that closes down a Russian market that it desperately needs to survive. So right now, Russia and China have this wonderful relationship that's not constrained by a treaty where you must do this, you must do this. It's based upon, hey, let's see what's, you know, let's, what's in our both interests, our mutual interests, and let's adjust this on a daily basis and move forward. And it's kicking butt. It's doing well. Um, so I don't think uh, China and Russia are looking for any sort of um, constraining military alliance. They don't need it. Russia is the most powerful nation in Europe and China is the most powerful nation in the Pacific. They don't need one another. They can support one another. And they do, uh, especially in the Pacific. We see Russia and China flying joint missions, uh, et cetera. That's because they're neighbors. They border each other. Um, but in Europe, you know, there is no Chinese border with Europe. So there's really no need for a Chinese military presence, nor is it desired. Russia doesn't want it. It would be counterproductive. Wow, that's great. I'm glad we had that conversation because this is this is uh, important. It gives China the ability to be to support Russia 
and have plausible deniability um, to continue to maintain their policies of, you know, we don't want any aggressive military actions and we want everything to be resolved by diplomacy. So they can maintain their uh, current foreign policy. They can't have anybody, you know, people can point the finger, but they can skirt around the edges. Okay, that being said, what about this um, China, South Africa, Russia military thing. Is that more for Africa? What do you think about that? You know, there people don't know they're doing um, some naval exercises right now. And the U.S. is angry and they spoke to South Africa and South Africa said, go pound rocks. We'll do what we want, which is something new, might I add. African countries would not do that before this conflict. They've got a renewed bravado. Well, I think we're looking at a reality here where China is the dominant economic foreign economic player on the African continent. Um, you know, through their Belt and Roads Initiative, et cetera, they're plugged in in a way that no other nation is. Um, Russia's emerging as the most competent and reliable security partner. Now, the United States and France have been there for years, but point to me one American success. Point to me a French success. You can't. Meanwhile, uh, Wagner, the, uh, the the Russian uh, private military contractors, and their um, just doing great things. I mean, they're, they're, they're building statues to them in the Central African Republic. Uh, Mali is just thrilled to death with what uh, Wagner's doing. Um, you know, so it, it, more and more people are starting to say, bring it on, Wagner. We, we want some of that action. So, you know, you, you have Russia and China both, you know, involved in a successful way in the African continent. Um, the, the, the naval exercise is more symbolic than in, term, in, in terms of anything meaningful. It's not like the Chinese fleet has, has, has you know, sailed to South Africa. <laughs> there. It's not like the Russian fleet has sailed. They got a couple ships there. They're, they're primarily doing the, the, you know, just basic kind of stuff, uh, anti-piracy drills, um, search and rescue drills. You know, how, how, how do, you know, if a ship is in distress, how do you jointly come together and, and deal with that? What they're not doing is major naval maneuvers designed to defeat an American foe. Um, so I think the United States is more concerned about the precedent set for military to military relations than they are for any real military threat to manifest itself from these naval exercises. But it points to the fact that the uh, South African Defense Force um, is looking for new partners. Um, as Africa is looking for new partners, and these are reliable partners. These are partners that are that are there to stay. These are partners who aren't dictating, um, you know, uh, quid pro quo relationships like the United States does. We'll support you, but first you have to condemn Russia. But first you have to sanction Russia. Russia is not going in there and saying anything. That Russia has never said to South Africa, you must do X, Y, and Z for the Americans. Russia doesn't care. Russia comes in and says, what can we do for you? How can we work together? Russia is not there to, you know, undermine other people. Um, and, and the same thing with China. All China wants to do is business. <laughs> They're just basically, right. what can we buy? <laughs> what can we build? <laughs> Where can we go? Um, you know, China's not in there going, uh, before we build this bridge, we take a look at your transsexual policy. Right. Um, we're a little concerned that you're not too LGBTQ friendly here. And therefore, if you're not, we can't build that bridge. That's the American approach, which is there, why there's not too many American built bridges in Africa going up right now. China, on the other hand, comes in and say, we don't care. If you want to build a bridge, let's build a bridge. Right. Well, that makes sense to me. Um, getting back to um, the Putin speech, as I said, you know, everybody's talking about the START Treaty. We know the, real, re the reality of that. Dmitry Medvedev made a, a statement here um, that I was reading this morning, the former president of, of, of Russia, which he said to me, he stated the obvious. And that is that, in his opinion, the U.S. is uh, plan is to tear Russia to pieces and steal all of their stuff, you know, to break it into pieces. They've, they've written it down. For God's sake, if I write my plan is to kill Scott Ritter, I think you can figure out what my plan is. You, you, you can know what your plan is. Going. <laughs> exactly. Right. But well, and Medvedev said, plain and simple, <clears throat> we'll use nukes. I mean, he was plain and simple. We have a right to defend ourselves with nuclear weapons. Now, a lot of people looked at that and I started reading people saying he threatened nuclear weapons. I don't see it as that. I don't see any country that has nuclear weapons. Uh, North Korea said, if you do a, ta a decapitation strike to take us out, we'll use them in a defensive. Any country that has them would say, if you corner us and you're going to destroy our country, We'll push the button. But of course, what I read was Medev is threatening. Medev is threatening to use nukes. 
your thoughts? Look, I mean, Israel has what's called the Samson option. That is, right. bring it all down. Um, you know, if, if, if the Arabs ever unite and roll in and try to swamp Israel, the Samson option is right. everybody dies. And what that is, is a, don't swamp Israel. Uh, you know, I'm not sitting here saying that because I'm, I support it. I'm just saying it's the reality of nuclear posture. We have our nuclear weapons to protect and defend the vital interests of the United States. Um, Russia has defined its vital interest being the existential survival of Russia. Imagine that. And so when you in, embark on a policy that says our goal is to destroy Russia, break it up, et cetera, the Russians are like, oh, what well, part of we're going to use nuclear weapons to defend <laughs> ourselves? Don't you understand? Um, and when Russia, I mean, this is the other thing that gets me. When Russia says that, you know, Crimea is the existential survival of Russia. I mean, that is it. And when Ukraine goes, we're going to take back Crimea, and the West goes, that's a good idea. The Russians are going, what? What part of Crimea is existentially attached to Russia? Aren't you understanding? Do you not understand that if Ukrainian tanks ever did, for whatever reason, make their way to Crimea, that um, we will use nuclear weapons, and it won't be to stop the Ukrainian tanks. It'll be to get you who provided them those tanks. Uh, we won't be hitting Kiev. We'll be hitting London, Brussels, Berlin, Paris. Um, and I don't think the West is, is waking up to that because they don't fear the Russians. The one good thing about this war, and I don't like to put anything good on wars because, you know, I know I've been accused of being a little too pro-war, um, but I'm very anti-war. Uh, I'm just not anti this war because this is about right versus wrong, good versus evil. And um, the, the good thing is a Russian victory uh, will maybe inject a little bit of fear into Europe because that fear is necessary for respect. The United States was able to negotiate successfully with the Russian, with the Soviets uh, to create the INF Treaty and then later the START Treaty before the collapse of the Soviet Union because we feared them. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you, it's the honest to God's truth. We were scared to death of the Soviet army. We were scared to death of Soviet nuclear weapons. That doesn't mean we were cowards. We were ready to fight them. We were building up our own force, but we treated them with respect because we feared them. Right now, we've had, you know, three decades of post-Soviet, you know, uh, life. And the United States has never learned to relearn how to fear the Russians because the Russians have never given us reason to. The Russians have never been an irresponsible power. But right now in Ukraine, Russia is going to is on the verge, I believe, of not only destroying the Ukrainian military, but destroying the NATO war machine that's been backing it up, destroying it indirectly by grinding it up remotely. Um, and when this ends, NATO will be left with nothing. Russia will have everything. And I think Europe is going to fear Russia. And I think the United States will likewise fear Russia. And this is a good thing because you need a little bit of fear so that you can come up with responsible parties. Uh, you know, do you come up with a good, you know, wolf taming program if the wolf is just a compliant little puppy that's just rolling around on his belly saying, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. No, you're not, you're not afraid of it. You're just rubbing the belly, making him happy. But if the wolf's going to eat you, you know, then you need to come up with something that says, how do we keep the wolf from eating me? And right now, Russia's getting hungry because they're a little angry. Uh, and Medvedev, he's the, he's the bad cop to Putin's good cop. I mean, uh, the Putin speech yesterday was brilliant and it's, um, and, and how reserved he was. Um, he was a little animated on some subjects, but by and large, you know, Putin, it was a responsible speech. Medvedev's the, <laughs> he's the wild dog in the back. <laughs> and every once in a while you got to open the door and show people, we got him. <laughs> we're a nuke, we're a nuke. Russia, Putin's like, not yet. Don't worry about it. We can work this one out. No, you guys can come back to the table if you like. Don't worry, that's the dog behind the door, but I got the door shut. But, you know, the fact that that dog's back there should make everybody sit up and pay attention because, um, you know, we, we need to learn to fear Russia. Um, and I don't say that with glee. I, I would hope I, had, I would have hoped that we never need to get that situation, but we're acting with so much ignorance, uh, ignorance, well, ignorance and arrogance uh, that we, we don't treat the Russians with the respect they deserve. And so maybe we need to, we, we need to fear them a little bit and then we'll sit down at the table and we'll come up with responsible programs because we'll respect them and we'll insist on genuine reciprocity instead of what we do now, which is basically to dictate uh, an outcome that's to the unilateral advantage of the United States. That's not good arms control. Good arms control is mutually beneficial. That's what the INF Treaty was, good arms control.
You know, just a story, you know, from my law enforcement career, I remember there was a, this really big prison um, in our county and um, the prisoners did a, a sit down strike and they wouldn't move. They were out on the yard. And so they called the, the state police and they came in and, you know, the big police dogs. So they brought all of these guys and they lined up in front of the prisoners with these big police dogs. And, you know, they're snarling and they're slobbering and they're pa pawing at the air, just waiting to tear somebody to shreds. And they went said to the prisoners, all right, everybody get back in an orderly manner and go back in the prison or we're going to let the dogs loose. And the prisoners got up in an orderly manner and went back in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the prison because you can bargain with the prison guys, but you can't bargain with the dogs, right? Can't bargain with the dogs. Exactly. And <laughs> I mean, those dogs were, I mean, you know how big those police dogs are. They were a pretty horrifying sight. And afterwards, I talked to the guy and I said, were you really going to let the dogs loose? He goes, hell no, that would be illegal. We can't let dogs loose and tear people. He said, but the prisoners didn't know that. They didn't know and that. <laughs> they, yeah, you get my point. 